Hi friends, we are talking on this topic acute liver failure management. So this talk I had given in Nandiyal on uh, 12th April. Uh, so it's a brief overview. As you would agree that it's a big topic, so there are various components in it. So I'll try to touch the salient aspect about uh, the management principles when we are dealing with acute liver failure. So first we need to understand how do we define acute liver failure. So any patient with liver dysfunction who has encephalopathy and where INR is more than 1.5 or PT increased by 4 to 6 seconds and who do not have previous liver disease, that is very important. Some, that's why we call it as acute liver failure or acute permanent liver failure. So everything is acute where they do not have a pre-existing liver disease in last six months. And some of the exclusion is they should not have had autoimmune hepatitis. They should not have had Vincent's disease because these are all chronic conditions. And last but not the least is they should not have had a vertical transmission from mother to kid, so on and so forth. So encephalopathy, INR, without pre-existing liver disease constitutes the acute liver failure or the definition. So there are three uh, different types of acute liver failure. One is hyperacute where the whole liver dysfunction sets in within seven days. Then there is acute, which happens between seven days to 28 days. Then there is subacute, which happens between 28 days to six months. Any of these, one can call it as acute permanent liver failure or acute liver failure. So when we look at the etiology, there are multiple causes. So the predominant cause one obviously would possibly reconcile to is the drug induced. So acetaminophen or paracetamol is the commonest cause. And INH is also one of the implicated causes and mushroom poisoning or amanita phalloids. So one species of mushroom which causes poisoning. So wherever you read about liver failure, these are some of the etiological factors that are very commonly cited. And halothane is also one of the common sort of agent that is cited as the cause of liver failure. But what possibly we see in regular practice is the acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose. So the second important dimension of the etiology of liver failure is uh, viral hepatitis. So hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis E. It, it is clearly mentioned that hepatitis C is the less common cause of fulminant, very rare. So mainly A, B, E and herpes simplex. So recently in our ICU, we have seen herpes simplex liver failure. Uh, so it's, we thought it's very uncommon, but it is cited as one of the causes. And we do see it. So one should have this also as uh, one of the positive reasons. So then there is a metabolic component. So the way you could re re uh, recall the etiology is the drugs, viruses, and metabolic. So Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, autoimmune, and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. So all this you could put it as metabolic cause. And then we have uh, vascular causes like the portal vein thrombosis or Butcheri syndrome and tumor invasion of the liver causing liver failure like HCC. So they're also one of some of the causes. And some of the rarer causes are who have RV dysfunction, who is in a shock with RV dysfunction or RV failure leading to liver congestion and failure is also one of the reported causes. And heat stroke is some of the rarer causes. And significant chunk also is caused by undetermined cause where we will not be able to establish what may be the etiological cause. So this is just a pictorial representation of causes. The easiest way to remember is drug induced, drug, the viruses, the metabolic and vascular. I think that would be the easiest way to how you should approach the causes of liver failure. So when you look at the data, so this is the data which originated from the US on the prevalence or the frequency of causes of acute liver failure. As you see, the most common is paracetamol followed by indeterminate, where one would not know what is the cause, and other drugs, non-paracetamol drugs like INH, halothane, so on and so forth, are the third commonest cause. And the fourth commonest was all the viruses, hepatitis B, AE. So as you see, the commonest still remains the drug-induced and paracetamol still remains. And this was the registry data of 1,321 patients. So you have hepatitis A sitting here. Metabolic comes a little later. Pregnancy also figures out. So this is this is the, the sort of prevailing uh, commonality of the causes of acute liver failure. So now coming, since the topic is more on the management, 
So upfront, we'll be talking about the role of N-acetyl. So whenever we have a patient with acute liver failure, N-acetyl cysteine is something that is uh, cited as an important drug to be considered in management of uh, liver failure. So the way N-acetyl cysteine works is it causes replenishment of glutamine in the liver and prevents further progression of damage to the liver. And it also helps in good oxygen delivery to the tissues and tissue perfusion, so on and so forth. So it has the predominant effect is liver protective effect by replenishing glutamine stores. So this was a study which came in 2009, which is the most preference study as to the uh, benefits of NAC in acute liver failure. So if you see this study, you see the right hand corner, none of them are statistically significant, but when they did subgroup analysis, the survival at one year in grade one to grade two hepatic encephalopathy uh, attained statistical significance. So 72 patients survived as opposed to 61 patients where NAC was given. Uh, so and transplant free survival at one year, there was a strong signal towards attaining and did attain statistical significance as you can see there is 0 0.008. So transplant free survival at one year be it grade 1, grade 2, or all grades of hepatic encephalopathy, it did attain statistical. So NAC is com considered as a very important drug that one should consider usage in upfront in acute permanent liver failure. So this is something which most listeners can keep in mind that NAC, we do use it for most of the acute, uh, liver failure. So this, and there is a good sort of a data to substantiate its usage. So survival at one year for mine minor grades, the grade one or grade two, it did attain statistical significance. And transplant free survival at one year also, it did attain statistical for all grades of encephalopathy. So then the question remains, if uh, someone is treating liver failure in a peripheral center, when should they transfer the patient to liver transplant center? Because if a center is treating acute permanent liver failure and they do not have a transplant sort of a capability, so they should have some sort of a guideline as to when they should refer to liver transplant center. And it is shown that acute liver failure, 25% of them may need liver transplant. And uh, in conditions where the etiology determines the poor prognosis, 40 to 50% of them, especially non-paracetamol drug-induced liver failure, 40 to 50% of them may go on to needing liver transplant. So where the etiology poor tense, poor prognosis, the risk of needing liver transplant is much higher as opposed to in paracetamol, it may be around 25%. But in non-paracetamol overdosage or even like a herpes simplex, we had one patient with herpes simplex who went for liver transplant. So the risk of them needing transplant will be much higher. So who are the patients who would need possible liver transplant is anyone who have other organ dysfunction. So who have acute liver failure, but who are going on for other organ dysfunction, like who are going on to have acute kidney injury or who are getting hemodynamically unstable or who have respiratory failure, needing intubation and ventilation or who have developed acute lung injury. So these are the patients who, who upfront have to be taken up for liver transplant or have to be worked up for liver transplant. Or someone with INR more than two or grade two hepatic encephalopathy which really indicates to you that they shouldn't be in a center where there's no liver transplant facilities. They should be shifted to a place where liver transplant can be conducted. Or high-risk patients who are more than 45 years or less than 10 years. So they also should be triaged to be sent to a liver transplant center. Or where etiologically, you know that prognosis is going to be poor, like non-paracetamol induced liver dysfunction or halothane induced liver dysfunction or hepatitis, or like herpes simplex induced liver failure. So anywhere where you foresee there is poor prognosis, they should be sent to a liver transplant center. And when they are being shifted to liver transplant, even with grade two hepatic encephalopathy, uh, so one needs to take precautions that the progression to grade three and grade four compromising airway may be much faster. And uh, it is, desirable that they are intubated and airway secured before they transfer to liver transplant center. Most important, this I have to emphasize that anyone who has a progressive liver dysfunction, they should be put on a dextrose solution. Very often you don't do this. They go, they have a severe hypoglycemia and they have seizures 
which will worsen their intracranial hypertension and uh, herniation that tends to happen. So this has happened in tertiary hospitals as well. Please ensure where someone is heading towards possible need of liver transplant, they should have dextrose solution or dextrose infusion on the background and hypoglycemia has to be prevented at any cost because that can have a very vicious conundrum and uh, deleterious effect on their outcome. So dextrose solution, even when you are transferring the patient to a liver transplant center, it is desirable and advised that they, they put on uh, dextrose solution like 5% or 10% or 25% based on the severity of liver dysfunction. They need to have this on background so that hypoglycemic episodes are prevented. And this is a very important simple sort of a step that one needs to undertake when they are dealing with liver failure. So obviously most of the listeners would have heard this from their MBBS time, King's College criteria for liver transplant, which is very important for us to recognize because there is no other data even at this point of time or a better criteria to come up with a better criteria. Right now, as we speak, this is the standard sort of a criteria which is accepted mm -hmm. by most uh, liver specialists as one of the important criteria for liver transplant. So in paracetamol overdose, pH less than 7.3 is the sole criteria. If they're getting acidotic with pH less than 7.3, they have to be enrolled or worked up for liver transplant. Or it has to be any of these, all of these three, where PT is more than 100 seconds, INR more than 6.5, creatinine more than 3.4, or grade three to four encephalopathy. So either three of these components or only a single criteria of pH less than 7.3, they should be worked up for liver transplant. For non-paracetamol, non-A, non-B, it's very easy to remember. I've just tried to simplify because people get confused. So PT, the first criteria, the sole criteria for non-paracetamol, non-hepatitis A, B is where PT is more than 100 seconds or INR more than 6.5 or three of the five criteria where PT is more than 50 seconds. So, Instead of creatinine on the paracetamol, you just replace it with total bilirubin, where total bilirubin is more than 17.4 milligram per deciliter. And the criteria is the same as paracetamol, encephalopathy, but the time lag between the encephalopathy and the jaundice should be more than seven days. So it is very similar. So pH is the sole criteria for paracetamol. For non-paracetamol, it is the INR, more than 6.5. You can only remember INR. And uh, in paracetamol, it's creatinine more than 3.4. In non-paracetamol, it's bilirubin more than 7. That is the only difference. Otherwise, most other things remain similar. So this is the King's criteria. In some way, you have to remember this criteria or you can refer it when you're dealing with a liver failure patient. Now, we'll move on to why is it liver failure is important that we manage them effectively because of the mortality. When you look at the mortality in acute liver failure, the predominant cause of death in liver failure is multi-organ dysfunction. As you see, the big chunk of patients die with multi-organ dysfunction that sets in. After which, the second commonest cause is the infection. So they are very vulnerable for severe life-threatening infections. The second commonest cause is the infection. And almost similar cause of death is intracranial hypertension. It's very important. So that's why you would see that at any cost, fever has to be avoided in liver failure because that worsens the brain swelling. And seizures has to be avoided. Hypoglycemia has to be avoided because this can really worsen the condition of the patient in a devastating way if you do not take measures to keep the intracranial pressures much lower in ENSO. So we, in our practice where we do liver transplants in our hospital, anyone who goes into encephalopathy, we do put them on anti-edema measures up front and we do put them on seizure prophylaxis and we do put them on background dextrose solution so that there is no hypoglycemia that sets in, which can worsen the brain edema. So the third commonest cause would be intracranial hypertension. Actually, if you see the bleeding as the cause of death is very small. And it has been cited even in studies that bleeding is seldom the cause of death in acute liver failure. So, but it is shown that mortality, which was more than 80% because of all the corrective mechanisms one puts in place, is slowly and gradually come down to around 33% in last 25 years because of the understanding of the causes of death and hemorrhage also the risk of hemorrhage has come down from 25 percent to less than five percent in taking all these measures and intracranial hypertension occurs in 20 to 25 percent of the cases of acute liver failure and the commonest cause of multi-organ dysfunction is the thirst and very often the acute liver failure will have a lot of cytokine production 
and they have stress where they have tachycardia high temperature heart rate being high but not necessarily there may be an underlying infection it is the stress itself like in pancreatitis leading to multi organ even in acute liver failure there is lot of cytokine release and they have this stress response which leads to multi organ dysfunction so this is about what are the commonest cause of death in liver failure and let's very briefly look into infection so this slide is something which is unsettling for most of our intensivists because it talks about most of the liver failures who end up having severe infections and the role of prophylactic or empirical antibiotics which as intensivists we do not readily subscribe but when when i looked into all the evidence and reviewed the literature of uh, liver failure which came in a nature uh, journal which is a high index journal so it compels us to believe that uh, we should have a low threshold to start antibiotics in acute liver failure because this is uh, and most of the data obviously comes from studies which have done many years ago as you see this uh, which which is referenced uh, from a study from uk 90% of the liver failure will are at risk or will have infection and the commonest source of infection is 50% of them can have lung as the source of infection and 22% of them have urine as the source of infection and 12% have crbsi which are where they have bacteremia or catheter related bloodstream infection as the source of infection and it has shown that especially patients who are being worked up for orthotopic liver transplantation the giving empiric antibiotics or even empiric prof or prophylactic antibiotic has shown to reduce the risk of infection which i'm sure may be very difficult for intensivists to suffer because we want to see proof of infection before before we throw antibiotics but in most liver literature they talk about giving antibiotics in reducing the risk of infection especially in patients who are being worked up for transplant but what we subscribe to what possibly as intensivists we could do is rather than prophylactic try to do good surveillance screening two procals keep having a very high index of suspicion for infection at least surveillance cultures we can start we can keep doing to identify infection very preemptively rather than waiting for the patients to manifest and this has been uh, advocated or suggested in the literature that screening cultures are screening imaging to see if there is uh, infections that has uh, uh, that is beginning to happen and picking them up early on and treating them effectively may be a good way to look at it and uh, if you look at these reference studies from uk and even from denmark they do advocate using of empiric antibiotics especially in patients who have worsening encephalopathy who have worsening aki or worsening moa yes. so these are the patients where one should have a very low threshold to start antibiotics is what has been referenced in most of this liver literature so this this was something which we were always resistant to as intense which we wouldn't want to start antibiotics unless we have an absolute proof but especially in patients with acute liver failure who are going for transplant maybe we should lower our uh, threshold to start antibiotics and where we see a progressive worsening maybe we should consider starting and most of the time when liver transplant surgeons come on board eventually this patient gets started on antibiotics so that is the a sense that we should possibly have in back of mind because these patients are at a very high risk 90% of them do have infection and as you saw the infection was the second leading cause of death in acute liver failure so pulmonary consideration uh, so most intensivists hearing to this are experts in maintaining airway breathing and circulation so we won't dwell into details so all this the general framework of managing airway breathing and circulation has to be put in place where lungs are getting affected and it is shown that one third of the patients can develop acute lung injury ards and they can have high co2 and this high co2 can be deleterious for the brain because this high co2 has to be avoided because that can lead to increase in icp and vasodilation in the cerebrum which can lead to worsening of intracranial hypertension so this is something one needs to keep an eye that we should not allow acute liver failures to have hypercapnia or develop hypoxemia which can worsen the brain edema so little bit detailing i'll talk on hepatic encephalopathy because one of the important criteria for liver failure is patients developing hepatic encephalopathy why does this encephalopathy develop because there are a lot of photocable shunts and there are a lot of metabolites produced in the gut uh, with or the toxins uh, which gets absorbed from the gut and there is the effective detoxification of this toxic metabolites by the liver is not happening because liver is failing and it cannot detoxify all the toxic metabolites that are produced 
and some of the toxic metabolites which are purported to be the cause of encephalopathy is increase in ammonia 90% of the acute liver failures have high ammonia mercaptans and phenols uh, so on and so forth so these are some of the and short chain fatty acids so these are some of the toxins that uh, that lead to encephalopathy that get accumulated that fails to get detoxified and they lead to encephalopathy and increasing gamma within the brain uh, and inability to extract precursors of amino acids by the liver leading to increase in the gaba is one of the important cause for encephalopathy and there is increase in the endogenous benzodiazepines within the brain all this was on the hepatic encephalopathy and another important aspect uh, why encephalopathy develops is the blood brain barrier which gets breached in hepatic encephalopathy because there is breach in blood brain barriers so as you see this is the blood vessel with a lumen and these are the astrocytes this is the brain so there is breach in the blood brain barrier where you see escape of these inflammatory cells ammonia cytokines and lipopolysaccharides they enter the astrocytes or the brain cells which lead to encephalopathy and there is uh, because of the breach of the blood brain barrier there is movement of uh, some of these amino acids like phenylalanine tyrosine and tryptophan which enter the brain cells all this increase the toxic overload within the brain tissue which leads to encephalopathy and these phenylalanine tyrosine tryptophan are precursors of some of these uh, brain chemicals which is dopamine norepinephrine and serotonin so all in all the simplest way to remember is there is breach in blood brain barrier which leads to entry of all the toxic metabolites from the bed into the brain cells leading to encephalopathy so then there is something called trojan horse hypothesis which typically happens in astrocytes so in astrocytes they found there is increase in the osmolarity and there is mitogenic activated protein kinase which leads to increase in the brain edema within the astrocytes and this brain edema gets worsened and mediated by this aquaporin 4 channels which lead to worsening of this brain edema and within the astrocytes there is increased conversion of ammonia because there is accumulation of ammonia it gets converted to the glutamate so the glutamate concentration within the astrocytes go up so all this lead to worsening of encephalopathy and there is this activated glutamatase glutamase which causes conversion increased conversion of uh, ammonia to glutamate so which is the uh, phosphate activated glutamate which causes the increased conversion of ammonia to glutamate within the astrocytes which leads to worsening of the encephalopathy and the increased glutamate within the astrocytes lead to activation of this nmda receptors which leads to production of nitric oxide synthase and increased production of nitric oxide which leads to cerebral vasodilation so all these mechanisms within the brain leads to worsening of encephalopathy and worsening of intracranial pressure so all this whole mechanisms is called as trojan horse hypothesis which leads to worsening of encephalopathy so and this has shown in proton uh, mr based spectroscopy they have shown that myo inositol levels in the brain cells are low and there is increase in the cellular concentration of glutamate has been found in this proton uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy so so this is in attend as to all the chemical changes that happen so the simplistic way to remember is your glutamate level in the brain goes up that leads to activation of these nmda receptors leads to increased production of nitric oxide and vasodilatation happens and there's worsening of brain edema that happens which is mediated by this uh, mitogenic activated protein kinase and aquaporin channel so that is simplistically you can remember astrocytes as one of the important cells that gets affected and increase in the glutamate concentration leading to worsening of hepatic encephalopathy so then it has also been shown there is altered brain energy metabolism because there is increased ammonia conversion to glutamate it is shown that the glucose metabolism in the brain also substantially comes down and there is reduced atp production within the brain cells which means brain cells get fatigued and there is hypoactive brain that happens because of uh, reduced atp production and this has been shown in the cerebral metabolism uh, recording that was happened with pet scans so this is what they have shown and another important aspect they have shown is there are these large channels that that are present between astrocytes and the neurons where there is the lactate transport that happens and there is disruption of these channels so that there is no lactate movement from the astrocytes to this 
uh, neurons, which is also one of the cause as to why the lactate levels in the brain goes up and there is no clearance of lactate within the brain. So this is in brief about all the changes that happen in the brain, which leads to encephalopathy. Because encephalopathy is an important component of acute liver failure, we need to understand these mechanisms. So what are the triggers for hepatic encephalopathy? So obviously, when someone is in acute liver failure, increased protein intake is something that worsens encephalopathy, vomiting, hypovolemia, GI bleed, constipation, infection, and metabolic derangements like hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and diarrhea leading to hypovolemia. All these are triggers for hepatic encephalopathy. And any large volume parasynthesis or portocable shunts or, and portal vein thrombosis. These are all some of the triggers that can worsen the hepatic encephalopathy in a liver failure or any concomitant tumor or secondaries that may present in the liver. These are all some of the triggers for worsening of encephalopathy. And some of the drugs, obviously liver failure patients, when you give benzodiazepines or any sedative, dolpidem, narcotics, diuretics, all these can worsen encephalopathy. So now we'll just move into grades of hepatic encephalopathy, which many of you may be familiar. Grade 1 hepatic encephalopathy, where they have inattention, euphoria, or altered sleep pattern. So patients may be sleeping. Grade 2 is where they have lethargy or changes in the behavior and personality. And the daytime orientation or the time orientation would be lost. Grade 2 encephalopathy is when they start having flapping tremors or asterisks. Grade 3, they become more stuporous and deep tendon reflexes can, can be uh, dampened or can be worsened. Grade 4 is coma. So this is in brief about the grades of hepatic encephalopathy, which I'm sure most listeners would be reading from their MBBS days. So what are the treatment modalities for hepatic encephalopathy? Obviously, we need to take care of airway, breathing, circulation, and try to identify any triggers for hepatic encephalopathy. So acute liver failure may be very restless. And when they're very restless, very often to treat the restlessness, we may end up giving sedatives. And that may act as a trigger for worsening or perpetuating of the encephalopathy. So one needs to have a balance of that. And protein overload has to be kept in mind and has to be reduced. And lactulose to remove the gut toxicity and aiming at three to four bowel actions per day is a very important tool, which most of you would be using. Rifaximin is a gut antibiotic which acts on the gut flora and minimizes the production of ammonia from, by the gut microbes. So that, that I'm sure most of the listeners would be using it in their practice. L-ornithin, L-aspartate has shown to be of no great benefit in acute liver failure. So these are the broad principles where the key aspect is to identify the triggers of encephalopathy which may be any metabolic derangements or it may be infection or avoiding sedatives so on and so forth and, and lactulose to clear the gut flora to clear the gut toxins and rifaximin to sanitize the gut uh, flora. So we'll briefly look into cerebral edema and intracranial hypertension. So anyone who is getting encephalopathy, so they are at a risk of developing cerebral edema. So one has to do a CT brain to ascertain whether they are at a risk of developing intracranial hypertension and cerebral edema. So there's a huge debate about the role of ICP monitors, and this is hugely debatable. It is shown that someone with encephalopathy with a worsening brain edema, if intracranial pressure is more than 25 or CPP less than 40 for more than two hours, is shown to have poor neurological outcome in patients with acute liver failure. But the problem is, there are no clear ICP targets that are defined for acute liver failure. But what is interest is, the, although ICP monitor is fraught to have a risk of having an intracranial bleed, it is shown the risk of IC bleed is very low in acute liver failure. It is less than 5%. So the risk of intracranial bleed, although there is a pride that when we put ICP monitor, the risk of intracranial bleed is very high, but overall, the studies have shown the risk of IC bleed is very less in acute liver failure. But the studies have also shown placing an ICP monitor to monitor the intracranial pressure has not shown to improve the clinical outcome. So all in all, it is a center-specific sort of an approach whether one needs to put ICP monitor uh, or one need not put. In our center, we don't put ICP monitors for this. But we start treating them with uh, measures to minimize the intracranial hypertension by using osmotherapy uh, 
and so on and so forth, whatever standard modalities and anti-seizure prophylaxis and preventing hypoglycemia. So these are the measures we undertake in our center. But some of the high volume centers may be adopting to put ICP monitor. But there is no robust evidence to say putting ICP monitor will significantly change the outcome. Having said that, the, the dread or the fright one would have that ICP monitors would increase the ICP, IC bleed is also not true. So when it comes to treatment, so obviously there is a choice between mannitol and hypertonic saline. So the studies have very clearly shown that one is not superior to another. So you can use either. So how does mannitol act? So mannitol basically, because of its hypertonic na nature, it, ex it removes the fluid from the brain cells into the circulation. But having said that, mannitol may have a paradoxical effect because we know in acute liver failure, there is a disruption of blood-brain barrier. When there is a breach in the blood-brain barrier, the mannitol can escape into the cells and can lead to rebound or paradoxical worsening of the brain edema. So in our practice, we tend to use more of hypertonic saline, which may be more favorable, especially where there is a risk of breach in the blood-brain barrier. Because when there is a blood-brain barrier disruption, the mannitol can lead to worsening of or paradoxical brain edema, which one needs to bear in mind. Mannitol also has an effect in scavenging the free radicals from the brain. At, and it is shown to inhibit the apoptosis. So the dosage that is used is 20%, one gram per kg, and followed by 0.25 to 0.5 grams per kg, six to eight hourly. So there was a study done in 27 patients uh, where they've used mannitol, uh, where they've shown that ICP is shown to be less than 25 millimeter mercury. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and the mannitol to get the ICP to less than 25 millimeter mercury was not possible. And that was some of the uh, some of the things that were shown in this study. And the, the mannitol also is a very temporary effect. It is not a sustained effect. And the effect fades away after some time. So that is also something one needs to keep in mind. And when someone is using mannitol, one needs to keep a close monitor on the sodium levels, not to allow the sodium levels to go to more than 150, and not to allow serum osmolality to go to more than 120. And please keep monitoring the re renal function because mannitol can cause acute kidney injury. And as we saw, the risk of acute kidney injury is very high in acute liver failure. So one, so that risk is always there with mannitol and one needs to have a uh, eye on keeping the creatinine, checking the creatinine levels and not allowing it to go up because it can cause acute kidney injury. And mannitol has been suggested in patients who are uh, planned for orthotopic liver transplant. And seizure prophylaxis is important, but the studies have shown that seizure prophylaxis is inconclusive whether it has any bearing on outcome. So these are the two studies. But in, a, in our practice, routinely in patients who go to liver transplant in acute liver failures, they are put on seizure prophylaxis to prevent worsening of brain edema. And most importantly, it may not be uh, generalized tonic clonic, many of these patients can have non convulsive status. Unless we do EEG, we may not be able to recognize this non convulsive status that may be prevailing or that may be one of the cause for worsening encephalopathy as well. So, these are some of the things that one needs to keep in mind that although they may not be seizing actively, NCS is something that may have, be one of the reasons for worsening encephalopathy. So, in our practice, any acute or failure, we put them on prophylactic uh, anti seizure medications so that we prevent any of these inadvertent seizures which may lead to worsening. So very quickly into cardiovascular con considerations, because any patients with acute liver failure, there is a multi-system effect. So it has an effect on all the other organs. It has effect on the kidneys. It has effect on the brain. It has effect on the heart and so on and so forth. So on the heart, it is shown that it, it behaves like sepsis. So there is reduction in the venous return and there is this peripheral arterial dilatation. So SVR will be low. Peripherally, they are dilated. So systemic vascular resistance is low. So they, they do typically present like sepsis. As I said, thirst is something that is prevailing. And in thirst, we see all this. There is peripheral arterial dilatation. There is reduced in the venous return. Increase in the portal pressure happens even in acute liver failure. So vasopressors has to be initiated up front. After, obviously, you have looked for all the volume responsiveness. So MAP has to be maintained more than 75. And CPP, if you have ICP monitor, should be kept at 60 to 80. 
and vasopressors are shown to increase the hepatic blood flow and that is one of the advantage of using vasopressors up front if there is a lv dysfunction then dobutamine has to be started to circumvent this and vasopressin has is to be considered as a second choice at the dose of 0.04 units per minute but one of the risk of using vasopressin early is it can increase the intracranial pressure which all of these patients have so many of the patients with acute liver failure can have adrenal dysfunction or adrenal insufficiency so steroids has to be thought of especially when they are refractory to norepinephrine early on so this is something one needs to keep in mind that they can have adrenal insufficiency and steroids has to be considered uh, to uh, reduce the dosage of vasopressor or to have vasopressor sparing effect and many of these acute liver failure we said bleeding they are at a risk of bleeding because they have high inr and many of these patients have low platelets and the studies have shown 50 to 70% of patients with acute liver failure have low platelets but as you see the risk of significant bleeding is very uncommon so that is a very important message just because their inr is high just because their platelets are low it doesn't mean that they have life threatening bleed studies have shown that the significant life-threatening hemorrhage is uncommon in acute liver failure. And we also have seen in our practice that they do not have intracranial hemorrhage or life-threatening hemorrhage seldom do happen. But insignificant hemorrhage is common in most of these patients. Like they can have mucosal bleeding, they can have gum bleeding, they can have even GI bleeds because of erosive gastritis. But, but they wouldn't have catastrophic life-threatening bleeding. And the simple H2 blockers are PPIs has shown to reduce the GI hemorrhages and blood transfusion need to be preserved only in patients with active bleeding or where invasive procedures are undertaken. So, which is a very important, we don't give unnecessary transfusion only to correct INR. We should not give unnecessary platelets just to correct the low platelet count. All this to be given only when there is active hemorrhage that is happening or invasive procedures planned, which is very important. So we spoke about encephalopathy, we spoke about intracranial hypertension, we spoke about cardiovascular dysfunction, we spoke about bleeding, and acute kidney injury is also very common. 50% of the patients of acute liver failure can end up having acute kidney injury, and 76% of the patients with paracetamol overdose can end up with acute kidney injury. And most of the acute kidney injury is due to the acute tubular necrosis due to direct toxic effect of paracetamol or any of these drugs, halothane, or amanitophaloids or mushroom poisoning or any other drugs that leads to acute liver failure can cause direct acute kidney injury due to ATN, due to direct toxic effect. I mean, some of these patients can have functional acute kidney injury, which very much similar to hepatorenal syndrome. The way to recognize this is to doing some of these tests, urine sodium less than 10 millimoles or lack of or absence of uh, urinary sediments and non-responsive to the fluid resuscitation is some of the ways to rule out the pre-renal causes. Once you have ruled out the pre-renal cause and once you have ruled out the renal cause, you could blame it as possibly functional acute kidney injury or heptorenal syndrome, which may be the cause of acute kidney injury. And renal replacement therapy, the, the commonest indications for renal replacement therapy in acute liver failure is someone who remains oliguric or anuric or where ammonia is more than 150 micromoles or there is jump in the serum creatinine by more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter. There are other relative reasons as to why RRT is done when there is volume overload, when there is worsening of acidosis or there is electrolyte abnormalities, RRT has to be considered. So these are some of the uh, issues that we face with acute kidney injury. So last couple of slides on transplantation. So we have looked at all the organ dysfunction, cardiovascular dysfunction. We have looked at the bleeding. We have looked at the brain component, encephalopathy, intracranial hypertension. We looked at the acute kidney injury. So which are the patients that should be considered for transplantation? It is shown that 10% of the patients with paracetamol only end up with OLT, orthotopic liver transplant. So only 10%. So most of them with a good management, they tend to recover. But 30 to 50 percent of non-paracetamol overdosages end up with orthotopic liver transplant. And post-transplant, the long-term survival is shown to be 70 to 75 percent of them survive at three years after post-transplant. And there are certain patients who have to be prioritized for liver transplant, which we have spoken as to which are the patients which, which have to be sent for the liver transplant center. We spoke early on. So, and some of 
the patients who have to be considered as high priority for liver transplant is where you see that there is worsening liver dysfunction or life expectancy is less than seven days. It means they have to be put on a high priority list in the transplant register or someone who developed encephalopathy or progressive encephalopathy within eight weeks who do not have pre-existing liver disease or who are more than 18 years or someone who has gone on to needing dialysis or who is ending up on ventilator or INR more than two. All these have to be put on high priority. In US, they call it a status 1A priority, which means in the transplant list, they need to be put on a very high priority when any of these criteria are there, where you know that patient is not going to survive for more than seven days or who is ending up on a ventilator or who is going to multi-organ failure or who have other organ dysfunction, who is going on dialysis, which we have looked at uh, even in the previous three where we said which are the patients who needs to be referred to the liver transplant, same parameters remain as the criteria for being on the high on the list. So what are the future perspectives? Future perspectives is we have a lot of these artificial liver support devices like uh, MARS, which is molecular adsorbent recirculation system. And we have Prometheus system or single pass albumin dialysis. So these are some of the liver support uh, systems that are available, like how we use dialysis to support the kidney. These are the liver support assist devices. So, but there is no robust data to say because these are only the bridges for the transplant and they cannot be maintained, liver cannot be maintained on long term on any of these support devices. So there are other novel innovative uh, measures that are tested out. High volume plasma pheresis has been tested out and all this, mind you, are the bridge to transplant. The definitive treatment is only transplant. Until you are awaiting transplant, some of these methodologies can be adopted. They have tried hypothermia, but the evidence has not been very strong. They have tried l ornithine phenyl acetate. So all these have been tried, but these are all only the bridge for definitive treatment would still be transplant. So the conclusion is the optimal management of acute liver failure is still poorly defined. One thing we can remember is whenever you identify a patient with acute liver failure, up front, please start n acetyl because there is reasonable data to suggest that transplant-free survival at one year did attain statistical significance in the study that I showed. And uh, even worsening of uh, liver dysfunction in grade one and grade two has shown to be reversed or gotten better by early usage of n acetyl And all this acute liver failure has to be managed in ICU where there is a good expertise to manage this. And and it has to be managed in a place where there is liver transplant facility available. They should not be managed in a place where there is no facility for liver transplant. And I showed you all the variables which indicate who are these patients who should be transferred to a liver transplant center. And this is most important for an intensivist. Intensivist should take all measures to minimize the patient developing any infection because 90% of them develop infections and, the, and infections are the second leading cause of death in liver failure. So one has, as an intensivist, you should take extraordinary measures in minimizing the risk. Most importantly, intensivist role is to minimize the risk of them developing intracranial hypertension or brain edema. So one has to be preemptive in starting measures, starting osmotherapy, starting seizure prophylaxis and preventing hyperthermia and taking all those general measures to prevent worsening of brain edema is an important task for an intensivist. And this has shown to have a phenomenal influence on improving the survival. And most of these liver failure patients develop this huge cytokine surge, a cytokine storm, which is the commonest cause of them developing thirst or multi-organ dysfunction. But whether we have tools to interrupt this cytokine storm leading to multi-organ is something that needs to be evaluated. And liver support devices, all the Mars, Prometheus, PAD, they need to be further explored whether they have a definitive role in preventing. At this point of time, there's no robust evidence to say that will reverse the liver failure. At best, they act as a bridge for definitive therapy, which is the transplant. So thank you one and all. You can visit my website, uh, www.drpadithanga.com to rehear to this lecture. So thank you one and all.